this event. I want to welcome you to NEDEX, Ideas That Elevate. This is a newly created annual event for the peak to peak communities and is devoted to the sharing of innovative ideas through a live public speaking event. Tonight, we are excited to feature and celebrate women authors of the peak to peak area. We have a diverse and interesting group of six writers that will entertain, inspire, motivate, or leave you just feeling a little better off for hearing their story. The evening will be split into two sessions. After the first three speakers, we will take a short break and enjoy refreshments in the hallway. Feel free to stretch your legs. We will have talented musicians from the Twintet Quartet to entertain you during the break. When we return, we will present our three final speakers for the evening. Before you leave, there is time to meet with the authors in the, outside the auditorium for discussion of tonight's event and to view and purchase any books. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our first speaker tonight. Krista Crabtree has lived in the Peak to Peak area for 20 years. She is a freelance writer and the author of the engaging and educational children's book, Being Stella. Please help me welcome Krista Crabtree to the stage. The Mentor and the Muse. The Mentor and the Muse. Are they like food and water to the writer or artist? Are they necessary for nourishment of the craft? History certain, certainly illustrates that many great writers and artists had both. But what if you are your own true mentor and your mind holds the key to discovering your muse? What if all that creative power is in your hands and not necessarily in the hands of someone else? How do you find your inner mentor and muse in order to access what the writer Joyce Carol Oates called the joyful exercise of the imagination. These are some of the questions that I'd like to explore here. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the etymology, or origin of the word mentor, comes from the Greek name mentor, the name of the advisor Odysseus' son Telemachus in Homer's Odyssey had. Not only did mentor advise the young Telemachus, but later the goddess Athena visited Telemachus in the form of mentor to advise him on how to fight off the suitors of his mother while his father was away at war. The word mentor was adopted into Latin, French, and English and came to mean trusted advisor, friend, teacher, and wise person who imparts wisdom. Also interesting to note is that the root of men refers to states of mind or thought and further down this rabbit hole, it's possibly a derivative of the Sanskrit word for manas, for mind and spirit, or muna, for sage and seer. I like to think that the root of the word mentor began with thought, and the thought created a word that means to be in the state of thought, and that comes from within. So that the thought advises a writer or an artist to nurture the flower of an idea. What is life but the angle of vision, asked Ralph Waldo Emerson, the leader of the transcendentalist movement, and by the way, a mentor to Henry David Thoreau. Wisdom is like electricity, he said. There is no permanent wise man or woman, but man capable of wisdom, who being put into certain company or other favorable conditions, became wise as glasses rubbed acquire power for a time. I love stories about mentors, and I always wanted one. Ram Dass, the psychologist, spiritual leader, and writer of such books as Be Here Now, had many mentors, including a guru named Maharaji. After meeting Maharaji, Ram Dass published his book about his spiritual journey, which went on to sell two million copies since he first published it in the 70s while living in a spiritual community in Taos, New Mexico. 
The poet and editor Ezra Pound mentored T.S. Eliot and advocated to publish the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock in Poetry Magazine. Pound worked with Eliot on The Wasteland and was thanked by Eliot in the poem's dedication. The writer and teacher Joyce Carol Oates was so taken by the writer, writing of her student Jonathan Safran Foer, who wrote the best-selling book Everything is Illuminated, that she wrote a letter to his parents telling them about his immense talent. Because of Oates' mentorship, Thor became a writing teacher as well. There are many, many more examples of profound mentor-mentee relationships, but do you need to put all of your trust, hopes, desires in the hands of someone else to be a successful writer or artist? I think the first step is to be educated in the craft of your chosen artistic expression, and a big part of that comes from teachers arguably both good and bad ones. It also comes from observing the work of other writers and artists. I've never had a bona fide mentor, but I've had a lot of teachers, like Elizabeth, an artist in residence at my middle school, and Rob, a poet and my thesis advisor in college. They were the most positive influencers. Sadly, some of the methods of, of teaching methods of people in my life have not always been pleasant. When I was an intern at Ski Magazine, there was a Swiss-German editor who yelled at me for not linking and connecting my paragraphs. I cried after that. Then I printed out the article, I cut up the paragraphs old school style, and I looked at how the order could be more logical and coherent. I learned that each point or paragraph should have some connection to the preceding one and the one that follows. I later had a boss tell a friend of mine on a chairlift that I had a lot to learn. I was upset when I heard that, but he was right. I did, and I still do have a lot to learn. I spend a lot of time reading and admiring art, and therefore the artwork or piece of writing becomes my mentor, lean, leaning them on the, leaning then on the definition of mentor as pertaining to thought that imparts some wisdom. Okay, so you learn your craft and how to make art. Now, where do the ideas come from? Well, if you're like Walt Whitman, another writer and transcendentalist and nature lover, then you lean and you loaf at your ease, observing a spear of summer grass. In his epic poem, Song of Myself, it's clear that Whitman found his muse in nature, and I love the line, I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. The naturalist and preservationist John Muir, also known as John of the Mountains, said, wilderness is a necessity. And for me, it is a necessity because that's where I think best. Many writers and artists famously had human muses, which makes for very romantic stories. F. Scott Fitzgerald had his wife, Zelda, who allegedly inspired parts of the great Gatsby. Jack Kerouac had Neil Cassidy, thinly veiled as Dean Moriarty in On the Road. Jane Austen loved Tom Lefroy, and the unrequited love probably inspired parts of Pride and Prejudice. Dante had Beatrice, who's, who appears as one of his guides in the Divine Comedy. The surrealist Salvador Dali had Elena, who, also known as Gala, his wife, and herself an artist. Rodin, who sculpted The Thinker, had Camille Claudel, who was his assistant and muse. But as a sculptor herself, were they muses for each other? Vermeer had the girl with the pearl earring, and Picasso, well, Picasso had multiple muses, <laughs> such as Marie Therese Walter, who inspired more of his paintings than any other woman. The word muse can be used as both a noun and a verb. To muse, according to the online entomology dictionary, means to reflect, ponder, meditate, to be absorbed in thought. The 12th century French word muse is thought to literally mean to stand with one's nose in the air, or possibly to sniff about like a dog who has lost the scent. <laughs> muse as a noun comes from one of the nine muses of classical mythology, the daughters of Zeus and Mnemosyne, protectors of the arts. Mnemosyne is derived from the word mnemonic, which means remembrance of memory. Muse is most likely derived from the Latin word musa and the Greek word mosa, meaning music or song. It makes me think about how strong our memories are of great music and art. 
Today, use is defined as a person or a personified force that is the source of inspiration for an artist. I prefer to take the meaning of muse as the force and not a person that provides the source of inspiration. Last year, for example, in Florence, Italy, my family and I arrived to beat the crowds, arrived early to beat the crowds at the Galleria dell'Accademia to see Michelangelo's David. We entered through the hall of the prisoners, past four or five sculptures called the slaves, earlier works by Michelangelo that seemed to struggle out of the marble they were carved in. And then, incredibly tall, under a circular skylight, stands David. My throat caught and tears welled up in my eyes. I was overcome at how magnificent it was. Not just the set and the setting, but the artistry, the scale, and the beauty. That was extremely memorable and visceral feeling I had that I felt from art. And if you close your eyes, I'm sure that you could recall a similar feeling too. The next question then is, how do you know if art is good? Well, Emily Dickinson, <coughs> Emily Dickinson said, if I phys feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. Many artists and art lovers feel a visceral reaction to the art that they love. It's what makes you pause in front of a painting, to really feel it deeply. It's what causes you to reread a line in a book or a poem. It's what makes your eyes tear up when you're, tear up when you're listening to evocative music. It would be very stimulating to live in an ecstatic reality of losing the top of your head. But I think contemplation is where a lot of ideas percolate. I realize that I think very clearly and openly when walking through the woods. There's a practice in Japan called Shinrin-yoku, and it really, it's called Shinrin-yoku, or forest bathing, which literally translates to taking in the forest. Among the benefits, according to practitioners, are relaxation, connections with nature, and perhaps reaching new insights. I spent my childhood playing among the birches and hardwood trees of New Hampshire. Think of Robert Frost's line, one could do worse than be a swinger of birches, and you get the picture. For me, those times of playing, imagining, observing, and connecting with the natural world is where I stood with my nose in the air and sniffed about or first begin to reflect, ponder, and meditate. Developing my muse meant being quiet enough to listen to it. I haven't written my magnum opus yet. I have written two theses full of poetry, 20 years worth of magazine and website articles, and two children's books. What I realize is that creating art is about trusting your instincts and accessing those lessons or feelings that imprinted something in you during your life journey. You don't need a physical muse as a good luck charm or a source of inspiration, though someone or something could provide that for you. But know that you could listen to the inner mentor that has the power to literally or figuratively knock the top of your head off. I think that the mentor is the voice and the muse is the object the person, place, or thing that gives you a visceral feeling and compels you to create. Essentially, it's the splinter in the creative part of your brain that keeps festering until you itch it and express that idea. Though I love stories of mentors and muses, I didn't have any in mythic proportions, no guru or charismatic leader, no jilted lover, not even a professor who wrote to my parents to tell them what a genius I was. <laughs> But I did have some inspirational writers in my life. I always had a voracious appetite for books and a fondness for art and music. Otherwise, it's been the trees and me, and I've been leaning and loafing in the forest my whole life. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Cindy Weaver. Cindy has lived in Netherlands for 13 years. She's the author of the deeply touching and inspiring book, Losing My Breath from Lost to Transformation. Please help me welcome Cindy Weaver.
Native Truth, Birthing Life from Pain. Life is just a little bit enchanting. This season of change and transformation on the mountains is magical. In this moment and these days, I've been feeling joy. I've been feeling this magic weave in and out of my life. This happiness is part of the human experience that we all share. But as I look out tonight at your faces, I know that there is another experience that we all share, another human experience. And that is the experience of pain, of loss, of sorrow, and of grief. And this can happen on a continuum. We have some of our smaller losses, which we deal with in a few steps, handle some emotions and their history. And then we have the larger life events that we know will be with us forever. And we have to integrate them into our life. On October 24th, 2010, On a warm October day, I lost my daughter, Chloe. She was riding her bike with a friend on a country road, and she was struck by a vehicle and killed instantly. The world stopped spinning on that day. It just froze. And then it just started spinning out of control, and I had no idea what to do. I had no container to hold it in. I had no point of reference, no steps, and I wasn't sure who to turn to for my specific loss. So I just walked out into the woods, and I found this place between three aspen trees, and I lay down on the earth, my back to the dirt, and I broke, and I cried, and I shattered. I did this again and again. I took Chloe's blanket with me, and I rolled it up, and I held it against me, feeling like I may be able to hold her again. In the spring when the, the, the earth was damp, I would lay it down under me and lay on top of it. If there was a breeze, I laid it over me. Sometimes I wrapped it around me like a shawl. I allowed anything to happen between those three trees, any emotion, any ranting, crying, anger, and silence. I allowed anything to happen between those three trees as long as it was true. At this time, I didn't answer the phone. I didn't return texts. I deleted emails. And I didn't really answer the door. I did not attend grief groups, although I was told that would be good for me. I didn't attend social events, although I was told that would be distracting for me. I didn't pursue grief therapy. I turned down the voices that told me who to be, what to believe, and how to live. Now, all of these are valuable. But I did not want to go there until I had allowed life to stop. To be in a place where no feeling or experience was off limits. And that is the gift that the woods gave to me. At this time I began writing. Pouring out my pain onto the pages of my journal, I answered to no one but myself. These pages allowed me to tell my true story to feel my own raw, uncensored, unfiltered truth. I began to unlock my heart, to ask questions about life and death, and go on deep explorations. At this time, I had two goals. One was to survive, and the other one was to hold the hearts of my family in any way that I could. And I failed at both of them from time to time, but I kept going to the woods. I opened my heart as deep as I could. I listened to all the sounds that can be heard in the woods. I watched the plants and the trees and the birds. I felt the air 
and the warmth of the sun. I laid on the earth and I felt everything that was true for my own life and experience, including moments of peace. I tuned in deeper to what really inspired me, to the things I was truly passionate about. In the center of my pain, I was finding a deeper life purpose. I was birthing joy by aligning myself with my authentic truth. When I crawled out of my reclusiveness and out of the woods and back into the world of humans and back to work, to my routine, I realized that in my grief, a transformation had taken place, a change, a shift. I wouldn't call this transformation healing, and it wasn't the end to tears, but I had found a new way to walk through the world. I was working and living differently, establishing new priorities for my life. I created fierce boundaries. I allowed people into my life that gave me life, and those that didn't, I just didn't spend much time with. I suspended the word should. I scanned the activities that I had been showing up at, and I realized how many of them I attended for someone else's happiness. It was really common for me to accept an invitation, drive to the event, pull into my parking place, sit, feel, turn on my car, and drive away. I was sitting on six committees when I returned to work. I looked at them carefully and I realized that only two lit me up. I stepped down from four. In the past, I had been a portrait artist. I love drawing faces, but I couldn't get my work to the level of perfection that I wanted. I couldn't get the emotion into the, face, the faces I was creating, so I quit. But now, in my season of grief and transformation, I began drawing and painting again, but this time it was different. <coughs> my art came out as more whimsical in style and mystical. I drew what I was experiencing and feeling in the same raw style as I had been doing writing in my journal. I was telling my truth through my art. In the fall, when I only felt pain with the coming anniversary of Chloe's death, and I couldn't find the beauty of the season, I drew myself into an aspen grove, and I wrote all over the painting every truth I was experiencing. I drew warriors because I needed courage. I painted characters of light against a dark sky. And when I was in the grip of fear, I painted myself facing a saber-toothed tiger and writing all over it thoughts to help me conquer my own fear. All of these shifts into becoming my authentic self was bringing me joy. Why do we involve ourselves in places that we're not totally aligned with our own truth? It is because there are two things we want more than anything in the world, love and respect. And we will do almost anything to get those. Even if it means living someone else's truth, responding to make what makes others comfortable and happy. We will sacrifice our own truth to the point of never rising or moving from our pain points, of never birthing life from pain. As I began to respond more and more to what was true for me, I started to call this my native truth. Native means the place where you were born. That place where you are an original indigenous inhabitant. That place that is home for you. Native truth is your wise, enchanted guide. Native truth is your essence. Native truth reveals inspiration, passion, and purpose, and this is where joy and life are birthed from pain. Your native truth brings you home. This discovery of my native truth and joy was miraculous. I never thought I'd feel this way again. But one day I was walking beside the river and I was overcome with grief 
and lost with Chloe that I just collapsed onto the riverbank. And I lay there and I cried. But I also became angry because I somehow thought that this kind of grief was history. That transformation hasn't happened. I'm back at square A. I'm destined to a life of pain. That was a sad day. But the next day, I was really a powerful truth. In my moment of darkness on the banks of that river, I didn't go seeking some pretend love and light. I didn't numb out. I didn't try to find a social distraction. I allowed myself to enter the dark. I allowed myself to break. I allowed the experience that was true. I learned that even in dark, that is my native truth. And it is only by allowing it do we arrive at a deeper life joy. Light is truth, and dark is truth, and together they birth life from pain. It is a given that we will all experience pain. It is the human experience. And I am so sorry, because I feel it. It is not a given that we will birth life from our pain points. That is up to us. But I have hope because I have birthed life and joy and magic from a very deep pain point. In order to birth this deep, enchanting life, you must allow any experience that is true and authentic for you. Turn down the voices that attempt to guide you away from yourself. Suspend the word should. Know what truly inspires you. Take some time to discover your own native truth. Come home to yourself and birth life and joy and magic from your pain. Thank you. introduce Jane Wodening. Jane lived in Boulder Canyon from 1948 to 1957 and went to Boulder High. She moved to a suburb of Rollinsville, Lump Gulch, in 1964 and her kids went to Netherlands schools through high school. She lived in Lump Gulch for 23 years. Jane spent one year, 1989, in Netherlands moved to 4th of July Canyon in 1990 and lived there until 2004 when she moved to Denver. She's written Lump Gulch Tales, Mountain Woman Tales, Drive About, Living Up There, Paper and Audio, Wolf Dictionary, Animals I've Neglected to Mention, and a few others. Please help me in welcoming Jane. <coughs> occurred to me to become a writer. For heaven's sake, I couldn't even speak. I, it wasn't that I had a speech problem. It wasn't that I didn't have a vocabulary. It was just that <coughs> when people would be talking about something, I'd want to join in, but I'd have to think how to put my thoughts together. And uh, really, that's, that's the main reason I write because I'm a slow thinker, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, um, I, I can hope that it's like the meals of God, but anyway, that, that's my problem and, and, my, and my guide and my whip and everything. Uh, uh, I, so that, now, the, what I really wanted to do, always, not right, but, uh, to uh, be with animals. I always loved animals and, and I, I feel like I understand them and they understand me, obviously. They understand me. Uh, uh, and I try to understand them. And uh, 
uh, actually I got I got uh, so involved with with dogs. Dogs are are available, or at least they used to be. Um, now you have to find them on the end of a string, and that's difficult. But uh, uh, I um, I wanted finally to write a dog dictionary because then people would understand what their dogs are saying to them and, and they would understand <laughs> animals that they came across and, and uh, I, I didn't do it for many, many years. I finally wrote uh, the Wolf Dictionary, which was a very different thing from what I was thinking of at first. So sometimes it takes decades before a book comes out in the, in the right way. Um, I did want to mention the difference between, I, I know that a lot of people want to be a writer, and um, um, my feeling is that, that well, if you, if, you, if you want that dream of being a writer, that's, then, then keep the dream. If you want to write, that's another thing entirely. Writing is, is something that you do because you need to, or because you have something to say, or uh, uh, actually people like uh, Isaac Asimov and Agatha Christie, I think they were, they just had to write, uh, they just couldn't stop. Was, uh, but, uh, so that, uh, boy, my eyes are good, bad, I can't. Oh yes, so, well, um, yeah, I, I did, I always read a lot, and I read a lot of animal stories again, and, and uh, so I've written maybe half of my stories have been animal stories, um, and, uh, and a lot about people too, and other things like adventures. Uh, I, I, um, I was so frustrated about, about the dog dictionary that I was having a conversation with my friend Barbara, who, she said, well, she wanted to write too. She wanted to write poetry. And I wanted to write a dog dictionary. And uh, couldn't think how to do it. And she couldn't get it together to write poetry. And we swore. We, we made a vow, we, if either one of us writes anything, we would send it to the other. And uh, years went by, and uh, I was writing journals. I, I was writing my journals, I'd write like, oh gosh, I saw a raven today, and, and he said, <laughs> and that's, uh, <laughs> that's hard to spell, but. Uh, <laughs> Do my best. Uh, I would like to say about journals, journaling is is a real, possibly a very good way of writing. It 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 can have suspense. It can have drama. It can have all kinds of things. And and so don't scoff at journalism as I did. And then I didn't I didn't send my bird journal to Barbara, which I should have done. But uh, then I heard that she was dying from her, her daughter told us, and that she wanted to see us, um, my, me, Stan, and the five children. So we all piled into her death, her, her bedroom, uh, circled around it, and, and uh, around the bed, and there she was. And she had hardly any hair, and she had, she was very pale and very, one and all these things that looked like dying and and uh, I had told the children you know you just smile don't worry about that about what to say or do and but my husband he was he was magnificent he gave a fabulous little uh, I don't know what it was a vignette of some sort and uh, and made her smile and then they all left because she was my special friend, and I was speechless. I, 
I was really speechless. I couldn't say a word. And there she was. She was. She had. She had. She had bones. You know. She was one of these women that had bones. You know, such beautiful shape of the bones of her face. And and then she had these big, kindly eyes. So she was looking at me with these big, kindly eyes. And and I was looking at her like unable to speak. And and she understood it all. She was she was a wonderful person. She she gestured. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right that I'm dying. It's all right that you don't speak. It's all okay. And it, and you know that you and I have been friends. And I shouldn't I shouldn't bring that up because it, I always burst into tears when I uh, say it, but anyway. So I went home and in the middle of the night I woke up and it was a hideous nightmare that my head on the pillow was her head on her pillow. And I realized that really for the first time that I was going to die someday. And uh, if I didn't write anything, I would uh, die without writing. And, with, and without having said the things that I have in my heart to say. And so I couldn't, of course, put my head back on the pillow. I uh, had to uh, get up and write. And I wrote about Barbara and about death and dying and about, about gestures like that one that she made. And uh, it took me about a week. To write the book, to write the story, it was, uh, and um, and I then I called up the next morning, and her her daughter and uh, and said I I would like to read this story to Barbara. Can I do that? No, she said she died last night. Yeah. She had she must have died just as I finished my story. That's my feeling anyway, but. She had passed me the torch, and I realized this is the secret. You have to be passionate, and then the words flow. And so, um, well, after I'd written that story, I thought, well, I'm not going to stop now. I've got to do another. What should I do? And I thought, well, I'll do this this story that I've told for 20 years. And here I am, without, without it in front of me, but I will tell it to you. And it's, I'll have to take this because it's a really one of these stories that you have to dance around a little bit. <laughs> so, we were, we were, uh, we went to the zoo, my husband and I and, and, uh, and uh, the baby. Uh, six months old and my husband was holding the baby on his shoulder and his, her little bare feet were sticking out it was a hot day so she just had her diaper on and panties and, and that was it and uh, we came to the orangutan cage and the orangutan came running up to us really came right up to us and was looking at that at the baby's feet uh, kicking and oh she was like oh she was reaching and she was like like she had such she had beautiful eyes too and and and, and a glorious face full of expression and, and and her arms and her hands were wonderful long fingers and and uh, and I said to Stan she wants to see the baby it seemed clear to me. Um, <laughs> uh, so he took, took her off his shoulder and put, put her on the on the railing there, and and, and baby looked at, at the orangutan and and uh, was kind of startled, but uh, and the orangutan just was so so excited. I mean, she wiggled her fingers at, and she was open. Oh, she like curved her mouth into a ooh. Like uh, saying, "Oh, the little darling," and and 
and uh, and then she reached her arms out way cl as close as she could to to the baby, and and I said to Stan, when she wants to hold the baby, <laughs> <laughs> but he 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 didn't. Uh, so, but you know, the orangutan was upset. The orangutan was upset, and I I think now. As I think about this story, and, and again, I, I think I'm learning again, another one little item that I hadn't thought of before, and that is the, the next thing she did was she leaped about and beat her hands, leaped about beating her hands on the walls to make a loud bang and screeched, and, and, and then she came down and, of course, the whole monkey house, all the people in the monkey house had gathered around behind us. There was, there was a crowd. She had gathered a crowd, and so she she came up in front of us, and she slowly reached her hands down between her legs, and she pulled up an imaginary baby and looked at it fondly, and she did it again and again. She did it three times, and it was each time um, she gave each one the full the full time and and uh, I I think I've seen uh, d like native women dancing that move to say I need I want to have a baby now and uh, of course she was saying that it was clear to me <laughs> uh, but it probably wasn't clear to those other people because they hadn't seen what went before. Then she went and, and lay down on the on the on the on the, on the cement and uh, and flashed fl thrashed her arms around and then she pushed like we do when the baby is just coming out pushed with her abdomen and then she got up and squatted and glowered and peed on the floor and then she jumped from shelf to branch to shelf up up to the very top and and turned her back on us with her face to the wall thank you very much show this evening, our event, and um, like I said at the beginning, we'll have refreshments and um, you can meet the authors in the outside the auditorium. We will have um, a group playing, uh, the Twintet Quartet will be playing music within the, um, in front of the stage here, and you're welcome to stay and bring your wine and your cheese and crackers back into the auditorium and listen to them. Um, and yeah, so uh, please welcome the Twintet Quartet. They're a group of talented musicians from Netherland Middle High School. Emily Giles on violin, Jake Giles on viola, Aya Pelcom Donahue on violin, and Kia Welcome, Donahue on cello. Thank you.
welcome back to the second half of NEDEX, celebrating our peak-to-peak -peak women authors. Again, before our next speaker, if you would just like to give a round of applause for our musicians and their beautiful performance this evening, thank you. Okay, opening the second half of our event this evening is Laura Redigger. Laura has left off Magnolia for three years and is the author of the beautiful children's book, A Liner Reaches for the Moon. Please join me in welcoming Laura Redigger to the stage. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm going to talk about writing for children, or how I made my childhood dream come true 50 years later. <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up? It's a question that everybody's heard, probably most of you have asked many times when you see children. I'm going to get back to your answers in a minute. Right now, I'd just like to talk about why writing was my answer for many years. I had other ideas too, but none of them were really as important or made as much sense as being a writer. The example I'd like to give that didn't make quite as much sense was I wanted to be a garbage collector. <laughs> I'm hold this. Um, the reason I wanted to be a garbage collector was they came to my house twice a week. And I thought, well, that's a great job. They only have to work two days a week. <laughs> Who wouldn't want that job? It was before I understood that everybody doesn't make the same amount of money and that these poor fools that were working five days a week didn't understand how good the garbage collectors had it. I had no idea they were in other neighborhoods the other days. So that was my childhood thinking. And what the reason I am bringing this up is because as a writer for children, it's really important for me to think about how a child's brain works, why they think the way they do. So, going back, what did you want to be when you grew up? Who here remembers what you wanted to be when you were eight or nine years old? Raise your hands, please. Most of us, right? Keep your hand up if you still want to do that and are fulfilling that current, that dream currently. There's a few hands still up, that's great. Me too. It was not a straight path from that childhood dream to being a published author. There were a few twists and turns along the way, but that dream did start very early. It was not a clear path, but I did do several things that made sense to being a writer, and other things that maybe didn't seem like they were helping me get there, but they did as well. So I started writing contests, entering writing contests, when I was in about third grade. I entered a contest for a national slogan um, for an anti-littering campaign, which ended up being a little bit adapted, but it was actually the one that they used. If you're old enough to remember, give a hoot, don't pollute. when I was growing up, which if you're, I'm looking at the audience, I'm seeing this group up here. Pen Pals was, we, we wrote letters on paper, we folded them, put them in an envelope, put a stamp on, we had sealing wax, anybody else remember that? Yeah. And then we waited for the response. Yeah, it was very exciting. <laughs> By the time I left for college, I was destined to be a writer. I majored in journalism, I took speech classes. Everybody believed I was going to be a writer when I finished college. My mother believed it so desperately that she saved all of the letters I wrote home when I was away at school. And I actually have them, they're in a shoebox. When I was given this as a gift, well, not a gift, but I, they were saved. When, when she died, I was given the box of my own letters. And so 
right now I don't think they're really worth that much, but if anybody wants to make me an offer, please come and see me at the table after, during the reception. During college, I studied rhetoric. I spent a full quarter with Jesse Jackson and his Operation Push offices in attending his Sunday services. When Ralph Nader came to campus, I earned one of the three coveted positions to interview him at a campus-wide event. If you're keeping score, that is two presidential candidates. While I was in college, neither of them won, yes I know, but still, I was less than 20. So, you're probably thinking I had aspirations for a political career, or maybe to be a speechwriter, but that was not my dream. My dream was to write for soap operas. <laughs> and before you judge me, this was in the 1980s, when soap operas were in their heyday. You had Who Shot J.R.? Okay, who knows that one? What show is that? Yell it out. Dallas, right. And so we all were tuning in on Friday nights trying to find out who shot JR. I can give you the answer later. Can't remember right now. <laughs> the other big soap opera that was always in the news and even made the cover of Time Magazine was Luke and Laura's Wedding. General Hospital. General Hospital, that's right. So writing soap operas was kind of a big deal that I had to decide, I actually did get the job offer. I would have had to move to Los Angeles. I was in the middle of planning a wedding. And instead of going to Los Angeles, I stayed in Chicago, got married. And at this point, who here still watches soap operas? Not very many of us. But, spoiler alert, the two that I had gotten a job offer for were Young and the Restless and a spin-off, which was soon to come, called The Bold and the Beautiful. Those are both actually still on the air. So I stayed in Chicago for the next 30 years, and I wore many hats, just like the peddler in Caps for Sale. Does anybody remember that wonderful children's book? I see a few hands. Oh, you, yeah, you remember that, excellent. So I'm gonna ask for you to, to help me here if you remember the book well. I, just like the peddler who sat under the tree and fell asleep, and then the monkeys all ended up in the tree wearing his hats, and he couldn't find the hats, and he looked everywhere. He looked up, and he, what did the monkeys do? They made fun. They made fun of him up in the tree. Well, my hats did not get stolen, and I had to balance lots of them over these 30 years on my hat. I raised three children. I did a lot of freelance editing. I did. A lot of work for magazines and court documents, um, proofreading and copy editing. I also worked for a few different large organizations. I was a volunteer for the American Youth Soccer Organization, which is um, an all-volunteer organization. I had 2,500 children in my personal program where I lived near Chicago. I was also a religious educator. And at 40, I decided to go back to school full time and become a teacher. But I never gave up the idea of wanting to be a writer. While I was teaching, I had lots of work with children. I read lots of books. Of course, I had read lots of books while I was raising my children. So it made sense for me to want to write for children. There's a truism. Write what you know. And I knew children, and I knew the kinds of books that they liked. So I came out here in 2016, and I was ready to write. I live in the forest, so there's so much inspiration, and I figured this was the perfect place. If you couldn't be inspired living in Roosevelt National Forest, I don't know. <laughs> so. I was inspired by the moon. In my book, Aliana Reaches for the Moon, was written with the idea that here I was in the first time living where there was no light pollution. I came from Chicago, where there's three million people, and now I'm living off Magnolia Road. I had the inspiration. So 
in some ways, I am the main character in my story, but not really, because it's mostly the children that I raised and the children that I taught in Chicago. So, I'm not gonna tell you about that first draft, which wasn't even called Aliana Reaches for the Moon. I'm gonna spare you all those cringeworthy details, because I don't have to share them now. <laughs> but I sent it to friends for feedback, and I thought I knew what I was doing, and I started going on Twitter, which if you're in, interested in being published, Twitter is really the place to be. It's the writing community. And I followed <laughs> agents, and I followed other authors, and I thought I was ready. So I sent my original, slightly revised manuscript to a few agents, and one of them, for whatever reason, because you don't usually get personal feedback, sent me back lots of personal feedback that included homework. Well, I loved school. Homework? <laughs> I'm all about that, here I am. I, I still have the email. I did all of the things that she told me to do. It was a rejection, of course, but I took it on the bright side. And I continued working on my craft. I joined SCBWI, which if you want to write for children, you have to join, quite honestly. Um, it's a society of children's book writers and illustrators. I joined a picture book online group, which is run by someone who lives not too far from here in Colorado. Uh, it's called 12 by 12. If you're interested in hearing more about that, ask me afterwards. Those were the things that really changed me and made me understand the children's publishing market and what the books were that would be sellable now. Not the books that I grew up with, not the books I read to my children when they were growing up. It's a very different world now. Different attention spans different needs. So I also sent the book to three publishers who accept unagented work. They are small houses, and one of them was Eifert Publishing, and that's who published my book. I got that, in that list, that information from my group at the Netherlands, at the Netherlands Library and part of the writer's circle. Some of my writer's circle friends are here tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, Penny Everett, a month later, sent me back that she was interested in the book and the series I proposed, pending illustrations and lots and lots of revisions. I would send her revisions as I went along. Um, I attended a very important conference the summer of 2017 and really came up with major revisions, which are pretty similar to what the book is as it came out now. Um, another year of waiting for illustrations. Publishing is a very slow business. My trajectory was actually faster than many, and I thought it took forever. So if you want to be published, you need to cultivate your patience as well. <coughs> My book came out February 19th to coincide with the full moon in, um, in February. That was two years after the email that I had sent exactly to the month of the first email I sent to three publishers. That same week that the book came out, I received an email from one of the other publishers that was a rejection. And it was a form letter, and it was two years later. And again, publishing is a strange business. I have learned so much over those years, but particularly since last fall when I joined a debut group and I could actually write a book about marketing a debut, but for now I'd rather write for children. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to introduce Lauren, Lauren Levitt. Lauren has lived in Mid Gilpin behind Roy's for over 10 years. She is the co-author of a heartfelt anthology, The Beauty of Authenticity. Please join me in welcoming Lauren Levitt to the stage. put this together because this is incredible. This is just amazing. Um, 
and I'd also like to thank the other female authors up here tonight, and uh, it's just incredible to be amongst you, and I'm honored, so that's the first part. <sighs> <sighs> now, okay, so it wasn't until I moved up here about 10 years ago that the idea of writing started to come up, writing. So, um, and most of, most of the time it was coming from friends of mine, uh, friends that were also writers and authors, um, my astrologer who was also a writer, and it just kept coming up and it was like all the time. And I hadn't really heard anything about writing that much like before, so I was like, where is this coming from? And it's not like it's a bad thing, you know, it's not, but I just, I got so defensive. So I think that one of my friends brought it to my attention because I love storytelling. I love the art of storytelling. And uh, her and I would share a lot of stories about um, living abroad because we had both lived abroad quite a bit. So we would just share stories and it was just fun. So when she mentioned writing, I just went, oh, wait a minute, that's different. That's like a box that I don't understand, you know, like storytelling's out here and fun and animated and get to see people and the reaction. And so anyway, so I would get defensive when I heard that because I just felt like, oh, and um, I had kind of like this non-conformist sign, you know, like, I won't do it. You can't make me do it. <laughs> and it's because I had a very different idea of what that looked like. So finally, my husband, um, he said, you know, he, he started to hear this too from other people and hearing the conversations and he said, you know, um, I kind of think you should. I, I think it's kind of a good idea. So why don't we get you a new computer and you could start writing down some of your ideas. And I was like, <gasps> not in my own home, you're not. You know, it's just like, Bleh. and uh, he was like, you know, okay, I think we need to sit down and talk about this a little more. You know, I think you're being a little dramatic. Not shocking, but anyways. So, one thing he knew that some other people may or may not have known is that my mother was an author. And she published, she was a romance writer. Some of them were other different types of books, but she published five books. And um, that was quite an accomplishment. And reading her books was amazing. So, What's interesting though, is her as a person, growing up with her, she wasn't much of a storyteller, she didn't tell you much about her life, because I was always curious, like, what, what, what's, what's this, what's this, you know, all this stuff. And so I think I learned more about her from her writing than anything else. And so watching her write, again, kind of like Laura was talking about, and this was in the 80s and early 90s. So this is before the internet, before the Googles, um, all that stuff. And so she would sit down, write, 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 all the time. And then she would send off these big, huge, monster manuscripts. Send it away, and it took forever, and then would come back, and they're all mangled, and things are changed, the titles change, and you know, she would kind of go, oh God, you know, not again. And, you know, kind of went on and on. And once she got her first book published, it seemed like it kind of took off from there. But, um, for me, I just thought, well, what if I don't want to write novels? What if I don't want to write romance novels? Or, you know, I just, it felt like it had to be like that, or that was my only choice. Um, and it wasn't really the rejection piece, because, you know, J.K. Rowling, you know, was rejected a lot of times before someone finally picked it up and looked where she is, you know. Um, it was more of, I felt like I was being forced into a lineage, you know, and I don't mind that so much. However, I had to find my own style. So I realized that first, I want to put this out there. This, this is just a question uh, for in your heads, I guess. But um, So if you go to Barnes & Noble, or if you go to Blue Owl Books, do you have a certain section that you gravitate to? Um, I do. I always have. It's either biographies or what's called self-help, and now I think it's called personal growth. Um, so, those are the stories I've always been drawn to. 
I love stories about connectivity, about how we've, well, how I've been lost or people have been lost and despair and, you know, things like that and just abandonment or feeling alone and because those are some of the things I've experienced. And I feel like if I am speaking or engaging in another person and they feel less alone in the world, then I've done my job, which is probably part of the reason why I've decided to become a counselor. Um, but that was a really big piece that kind of inspired me and it shifted that perspective just a little bit. It didn't have to be this, it didn't have to be that. Oh, those are the kind of things I love right now. Okay, all right, you know, all right, let's get this new computer thing and, and yeah, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll write down, I'll just start, start somewhere. So I sat down and started writing about my own life experiences. And I got an email first and then I got a call, which I believe is divine timing. And so this woman calls and she said, well, would you like to be part of an anthology that we're doing? And I said, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, what's it called? She said it's called The Beauty of Authenticity. And I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. You know, that's, that's deep. I like that. And uh, she was like, well, do you have any stories that something in your life you've overcome to become more authentic in your own life? And can you be completely vulnerable and raw? I was like, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And she, on the other, I could hear her. She goes, well, um, you can think about this. You know. <laughs> I said, no, 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 got it. Check. I'm ready. Sign, sign me up. And, um, and what's funny about that is those were exactly, that's exactly what I was writing about. When I was on the computer, those were the things that I already started to write about. So, anyways, I got to be part of an amazing anthology, and I got to know these women, and they're sharing their most intimate, exposed parts of themselves. And that's just such an incredible experience, and I'm still incredibly humbled. And the truth is, don't we all have a story? Maybe many of them. And we may share them differently, but we all have a voice. And that voice is something someone out there is waiting to hear. Your truth, your authentic expression. One of my favorite quotes is by Marianne Williams. Quote, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is not our light. It is it is our light, sorry. <laughs> it is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your plain small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people will not feel insecure around you. We're all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give permission to others to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. End of quote. Whatever that passion is that sparks your curiosity, it could be short stories, it could be novels, it could be poetry, it could be blogs, even a memoir, I encourage you to let that light shine. First, listen to it. Not from up here, I have a problem with that sometimes, but from here. Love it. Love it like a child. Don't judge it, just love it. Nurture it with curiosity to allow it to expand, change, develop, and finally to share it. We need more stories. 
and we are ready to hear yours. Thank you. She lived in Gold Hill for a year, here we go, and currently enjoys living near Gamble Gulch. Karen is the author of Rough Beauty, 40 Seasons of Mountain Living, a Colorado Book Award and Willa Award finalist. Please help me in welcoming Karen Avenon. talk here called Marlboro Woman, which is a little bit based on my book. Oh, don't get too close to the microphone. Okay, so um, I have a chapter in my book called Marlboro Woman, which is kind of like this. Anyway, so um, when I moved to a wood stove heated cabin at 8,500 feet uh, to live by myself for 10 years uh, with my unbelievably handsome white husky Elvis, and if you buy my book, you can get his picture. Um, <laughs> The questions I was most often asked were, aren't you afraid? And aren't you lonely? And last, what are you doing hiding up there all by yourself? <laughs> now I just want to point out that no one asked these questions of a man. No one said to Ed Abbey, what are you doing out there in the desert? No one said to Henry David Thoreau, what are you doing in that cabin? Um, that's because our stories, our novels, our adventure stories, even our movies, are full of narratives about men who go it alone. That's the norm. Um, that's our heroic tale. And out here in the West, you know, we have a familiar story, and that's the lonesome cowboy who lives up on the horizon, right? We know who that guy is. And uh, he's a bit of a legend and a mythic hero, and a lot of a myth. Um, some of us call him the Marlboro Man. Uh, when I was young, so I've lived in the West all my life, when I was young, I was so hungry for stories of women who went it alone, <coughs> like the Marble Man, like John Wayne, like Ed Abbey. Um, where was my Huck Finn, I wondered, and where was my Call of the Wild? Um, and with one exception, and that was Anne LeBastille, and hopefully you know her book, Woods Woman. She, uh, most famously, she lived in the Adirondacks in a remote, remote place, and she built her cabin by herself by floating the logs across a lake. She was canoeing with the logs, and she builds a cabin out there in the wild, and I was really inspired by that story. But that was the only one I could think of. So I had this, I wanted to be out there alone, and absent a role model, I landed on the Marlboro Man. I know he shills cigarettes, but that's who I landed on. So, um, <laughs> And I think a lot of us think of him, we think of stoic and he's isolate and he's super cool and he looks good in the cowboy hat. And um, we look up to him even though we know, we know better out here in the West. Cowboys live violent and dangerous lives. And we all know, we live in a mountain community, that um, the water and weather are the two great equalizers up here and no one really does it alone, even though we like to think we do. Um, so I fashioned this kind of cowgirl ethos after the Marlboro Man, and I made myself into what I would call, I'm calling in the book, a Marlboro Woman, which was the first title of my book, and they said no. <laughs> <laughs> that can't be the title. Um, and I embraced him actually out of necessity. I wanted to live this kind of big, epic life. I wanted to go out there alone. Um, and most importantly, really, I wanted to live you know, uh, untethered by the confines of gender. Now, being a Marlboro woman for me meant I could do it all by myself without anyone's help. And that logic was formed in growing up in the crucible, which is being a female in America. 
Um, seriously, 1973 was the first year a woman could get a credit card without her husband's signature. It's not that long ago. My mother uh, was forced to step out of her Air Force career when she got pregnant with my older brother. Um, frailty and dependency are the stories that I was bred on. Um, that, you know, in my family, one of my brothers, he was going to be an astronaut, and the other brother was going to be a chemist. And what was I going to be, my dad said? I was going to be Miss America. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so failing that, I would certainly make someone a good wife someday. So my role was to be so, a, play a supporting role in someone's life. Um, and I didn't feel like, I didn't feel demure, I didn't feel weak. I mean, I, as a little kid, I licked the sidewalk after rain because I loved the taste of dirt. <laughs> I was the kind of kid I was. Um, so locating my place, you know, in the world was like, you know, like stuffing my two square hands into very slim cotton gloves. Um, and it was frustrating. So I was determined to find a landscape that fit me. Um, one that allowed me to experience my own strength unapologetically. So I began camping. I all by myself, hiking all by myself, all over Colorado, Utah, Wyoming. Some of my friends thought that was really funny and they called me the Lady Explorer. My grandmother, oh my God, my grandmother acted as, as if she tasted something terrible. I was telling her about the time I spent in the valley of the sun and the moon, and I was camping, and I was 30 miles away from anyone, and it was really an amazing experience. And uh, she said, oh, honey, I don't know where you get this. <laughs> you know, as if I was like suddenly eating animal carcasses and wearing pelts. Right? So, um, so I did that, and then eventually I moved to the mountains. I became a real outlier in the tradition of Mary Austin's walking woman, who is a woman who legendarily walks off, her, literally, her name out into the desert. No one knows what her name is anymore. And I wanted to kind of be like that. So I want to say that, of course, I've lived everywhere in the mountains. Um, I've lived in tents and in tiny trailers. And, um, and really in every single funky mountain cabin that there is. Um, you know the ones with sketchy electricity, don't use that outlet. And uh, I had one cabin that between the wall, you know, where the wall ended and the roof, there was plywood, just plywood, and, and nothing in between. This was a cabin at 8,500 feet. Um, that cabin also had a tree inside that, I don't know, held up a wall or something. Um, it also had a coal stove. Uh, that was converted to wood use that warmed the wall behind it a little too much so that my my closet which was behind that wall got really warm and that's where all the mice slept <laughs> i also lived in a historic pony express barn in left hand canyon where in the summertime i bathed in a shower bag outside which was lovely and in the wintertime, I heated water, and um, I sat in a stock tank in four inches of water and bathed myself. Um, that cabin didn't have any plumbing. I just, it had a hole out in the back, and that's what I used. So, um, and I did it, you know, I did it because something in me wanted really to live wild and alone. Um, I wanted to be outside the confines of society. I got too many message, messages about who I should be, and so I just, walked away. Um, partly the society told me that I was weak, and partly it told me that I needed a man to survive. So eventually I moved to this cabin on uh, the top of Overland Mountain outside of Jamestown, Colorado. And you know, mountain living. I put up four cords of, winter, of, of wood each winter. And I shoot bear from my yard, you can read about it, uh, throwing chips at it, yelling, shoot, get out of here. Um, <laughs> I, um, I had, the, that cabin was made of wood bricks. And so uh, every, where the blocks were put together, there was no mortar, there was just blocks. And then so there was little tiny cracks of light would come in. And in the winter, of course, lots of cold air came in. <laughs> so I would walk around with a cock gun and try to seal up the thousands of cracks in that cabin. And uh, 
failing that, you know, one January, I woke, you know in January when the air is so beautiful and it freezes and it's crystalline and it's shimmery outside, and I woke up to that air kind of like floating in on my face. <laughs> so, um, you know, I had ground squirrels and critters in the cabin. Of course, I was, we were threatened by wildfire many times, um, and then there was the thousand year flood. Um, I took all these challenges, um, and I liked them. Um, they supported this kind of cowgirl ethos I thought that I needed to survive. Um, they said my heart was fierce, not faint, and they said I could do it all by myself. You know, and I did, and I was okay. Um, but then something happened. A shaft as solid as any, the trunk of any tree formed in me from living all those years alone. Um, it was a kind of certainty, a lesson in how to inhabit my own skin um, and believe in my right to take up space and my right to live unfettered by the sorts of messages that make little girls grow up into somebody they probably weren't meant to be. Um, but something happened. From that shaft grew some limbs. And in those limbs, I learned another way of being. Um, it was one not tied to kind of toughness or endurance or being stoic or even being alone. It was something that instead I learned from the seasons. Kind of, you know, this is the great thing about mountain living. Winter, spring, summer, fall. Winter, spring, summer, fall. It happens all, and it doesn't stop. Um, and I learned the art of surrender at the hands of nature. Um, the ebb and flow of seasons. And, and realizing, honestly, my smallness in the world. Uh, and from that, I kind of fashioned a new kind of resilience. And, and one that really involved embrace. So the first thing that happens is I get involved with my community in Jamestown and I cause a little ruckus on the arts board. Because, um, you know, I, I, I don't really know how Netherland is, but Jamestown is like every guy plays a guitar. <laughs> Something I find to be really annoying. Um, and so uh, all of the Jamestown events were like, let's put on a show, let's sing. And I'm like, how about some poetry? Um, how about an art walk? So uh, I caused a little bit of a, a trouble, which pleased me immensely. Um, and I also fell in love. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so when I think of what it means to be a Marlboro woman, for me it means being the hero of my own story. Something all women need. It means really living wild, and what that means is being a woman who makes her own choices, um, despite what is expected, and who's unafraid to take her own path. And you know, while the Marlboro Man is kind of a myth and a legend that hasn't really helped the West, I actually think that the Marlboro Woman can. <laughs> because for women, a Marlboro Woman means, being a Marlboro Woman means saying yes to going out there by yourself. Being not afraid to go alone, wherever that is, um, and being your own hero. Most importantly, it means telling your story. Imagine how the world the landscape that we know would change if little girls grew up the way little, do, little boys do, with their stories represented everywhere in novels and adventure stories and on film. I, I just want you to think of the last movie that you saw or movies that you saw this year and how many stories, of, how many stories did you see that starred women who weren't hookers or who weren't looking for a man? There are not many. Um, that's the world I want to live in. So you know, the world has changed a little bit from when I was born, um, but it's still not enough for me. Every single day I meet a woman who doubts herself, particularly among, gosh, particularly among the first years I teach at CU. Um, they worry about whether they are, are cute enough, are they smart enough, do they have the right clothes, and believe it or not, some of them are still sent to college to look for a husband. Um, I'd like to hand every single one of them a metaphorical hat and the reins to a horse and say, get out there. <laughs> I really now understand uh, the lonesome cowboy not as a role model, really, but as a metaphor for learning to shuck off the kinds of messages that are heaped on women, for the heroic journey, for living an authentic life. 
He captured my imagination because you know he's part of the mythic West. And myth is the engine of the stories that we tell that give meaning to our lives. So I'm taking him back. And yet, that lonesome cowboy is not really enough. He was never big enough. To do that, he would have to contain an understanding of landscape that works on you whether you ask for it or not, as it did for me. The writer Gretel Ehrlich says, everything in nature constantly invites us to be what we are. Not who, what. On the most basic level, I was landscape too. In the end, after 10 years, I realized I wasn't the lonesome cowboy after all. But he sure helped me become the woman I am. Thank you. tonight you can find some information about them there with their websites and a link to purchase their books and before we close tonight's event we'd like to invite all our authors back on the stage and give them another round of applause and we'd also like to say thank you to Kayla for making this event So first, Krista, thank you very much. We made these little, well, Eileen made these cute little cards. Thank you.